Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm pastor and teacher Curtis Omo, and today we're going to continue a study in the Psalms. We'll be looking at Psalm 76. Now, before we begin, let's make sure that we confess our known sins. At the same time, we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to control us. He indwells us right now, but we have to give ourselves over to him. We do this by choosing to do that. So let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and all that you have provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me introduce the psalm. It's another declarative praise psalms. Uh, declarative basically means it's spoken outward. Okay, so this is a psalm that was spoken in the worship services or one could do it by himself. In, in it, he praises God. The psalm begins with the praise, then it talks about why they're praising him, what God has done, or what he's going to do, or he's doing, or the cause for praise, and then it ends with the praise. Okay, so it's a lot about praise. Now let me sum up the message. I'll put on the board for you. Here's the message. I like to sum up the psalm to see what it's about we we'll get the main points i'll just read it to you because judah and israel knows that god defeats their enemies they have reason to praise god they have reason to praise god is to be revered that it means honored upheld held in awe god is to be revered for his judgment will sound forth and then he'll be praised because of his wrath on man that's wicked people and deliverance to the humble. That's the faithful people. Okay? And then we have a very brief outline. Let's look through that. We'll just get an idea of where we're going and what we can look forward to. A, God is known in Jerusalem by his judgment on the enemy. B, glory to this fearful God who executes judgment and delivers the humble. And then C, in our last two verses, give God who rules over all his just due. Now, I'll explain that as we get to it. Basically, it means you give it, you give to God what you owe him or said that you're going to do for him. All right, our first verse, remember we call that the superscription. This is actually more like a title but it's in the Hebrew, so it really counts as being the inspired Word of God. And we call this first couple of lines the superscription. To the director of music with stringed instruments, a psalm of Asaph, a song. Pretty simple. Well, director of music, of course, we know what that is. It says with stringed instruments, so there's instruments involved here in that worship service for this song. And then Asaph, Asaph is a Levite. Remember, that's the priestly tribe of Israel. He's one of the leaders of David's choir. That's in 1 Chronicles 6.39. He also wrote some Psalms. He wrote Psalms 50 and 73 through 83. He's also mentioned in scripture as skilled in music like David was. All right, let's begin by looking at our first two verses together. I'll put them up there on the board. All right. Now, this comes under our first heading, which we just saw in the outline. I'll put it back up there again. God is known in Jerusalem by his judgment on the enemy. All right, so here we go. Verses 1 and 2. God is known in Judah. In Israel, his name is great. His lair is in Salem, his den in Zion. Well, that's interesting. You know, a lair is a type of thing that a lion is in, or even a big snake. Let's talk about this. The Hebrew words for these two terms are uh, words that have to do with where an animal dwells. 
hidden, but nearby. Okay? Uh, in parts of Africa, lions like to stay in thickets. And they have their path out, but it's not easy to get in. And they'll hide in there. And when they see some prey or smell some prey, they can come out of the thicket and attack. A den, of course, you've heard of a lion's den or some other sort of den of animals. Well, that's basically uh, telling us that God's being portrayed here like a lion. He's concealed, but he's nearby. He's present. And this is something that people of Judah and Israel knew because God would act on their behalf when they needed him, when the people were obedient. It tells us here his lair is in Salam or Salem. Now Salem is an early name for the location of Jerusalem. That was even back before David. It was under the rule of the uh, control of the Jebusites. David had to defeat the Jebusites, but that's another name for Salem. And then his den is in Zion. Zion's uh, the mountain that Jerusalem set upon, or in this back then it was Salem. Okay, their early name. So that tells us that God is basically there. He's with you. He's in the city. He's on the mountain where your city is. Verse 3 tells us what God does. He destroys the enemies. Then he broke the flames of the bow, the shield, the sword, and the weapons of war. Selah. So here we have God in action. He comes out of the lair or the den. He goes to action for Israel and defeats their enemies. Notice the word flames of the bow. Usually we'll see arrows. But flames is used to show us how destructive he is. It's just not regular arrows. They cause destruction. As well as the shield and the sword, that's the defensive weapon. You know what a shield is. They hold up in front of them. The sword and weapons of war. God destroys the enemy's weapons. So basically, he not only disarms them, but destroys the enemies. That's the idea. So that's why they're praising him, you see. And Selah, if you remember, that's a musical notation. That means we pause. Now, we're not 100% sure that's what it means, but uh, that's probably the best guess that scholars can come up with. So you'll see this term, Selah, uh, probably means some sort of pause in the musical performance. All right, now. Let me just pause for a minute and mention to you what we do here. We interpret the psalm. We understand uh, the words that give us trouble. And then we go back and read it, either perhaps, well, we'll read it today, but on our own, we'll remember what we've learned. And we'll also see some of these same terms in other psalms, you see, so you can understand them as well. So that's our goal here. So you'll understand this psalm so that when you read it on your own, you know what it means. Doesn't do much good to read it and not know what it means, does it? All right, let's go to our next section. That's B, where we will see glory to this fearful God who executes judgment and delivers the humble. Now, this is most of the psalm. Uh, I divided it up in two parts. Let's look how I did it. One, God has victory over the enemy. That's verses 4 through 7. And then God has victory for the humble, 8 through 10. So, for the enemy, there's victory in that he conquers them for us. And that victory also provides the humble deliverance. Sometimes we use the word salvation, not to be confused with our eternal salvation through Christ. But... Uh, sometimes when armies go to battle and you're in battle or you're being defended, you want yourselves and your, uh, your own soldiers to be victorious. All right, let's start out with verse 4, where it gets into the victory over the enemy. But let's be, look at the praise here. It says, Glorious are you, more majestic from the mountains of prey. Well, this is an interesting second line, isn't it? More majestic from the mountains of prey. So first of all, we start out saying, God, you're glorious. 
This is praise. We should do that in our prayers, do that in worship. That is part of worship. But also says more majestic. That's kind of like a word like glorious, you know, in all his majesty. But it says from the mountains of prey. Now, what does that mean? Well, remember the analogy of the lion that we saw with the den was still up on the board and the lair. Okay, let me roll this on up here. Well, that means that when God comes back from his victory, like a lion would, from having been to the mountain where he uh, uh, got his food or destroyed his prey, uh, like that, God comes back victorious. And when he does, it's another good reason to honor him and praise him. He is majestic. And that's what this is saying. Like a lion coming back from victory on a mountain, having destroyed his prey or gotten his meals for his family or whatever it may be, he's to be worshiped. So this verse, by analogy, describes God as being praised for protecting and delivering Israel from their enemies by conquering them. I'll say that one more time. This verse, by analogy, describes God as being praised for protecting and delivering Israel from their enemies by conquering them. Here's some application. Israel relied on God even in battle. It wasn't just their own skills or their own weapons or their only or their large amount of troops, you know, where they way outnumber the troops, the enemy. It was the fact that they also relied on God. Now, in battle, we do both. We want our military to be strong, but we also want to rely on God. Trust in God. It would be wonderful to have a godly military, have a godly police force, have godly uh, law enforcement, uh, including judges and the courts and everything. That would make things so much better for all of us in many ways. But we don't have that in most countries today. It's kind of rare uh, if you can even get them to believe in God, but that's the basis of much of our morality and the decisions we make for what's right and wrong. But understand the point. Uh, when you go into battle, you need to rely on the, on the Lord. Soldiers do that sometimes. I know when I was in the military, I would pray quite a bit. And... Uh, whether we went into battle, and I never did go into actual battle, got close, but it didn't happen. But you're always praying and preparing your heart and your mind and that you'll do the right thing and, and do your job as you're supposed to. Well, verse 5 gives us some uh, more details on that destruction of the enemy. It says, the stout-hearted, the stout-hearted were plundered, they sank into sleep, and none of the men of war could use their hands. Now, this is an interesting way to put this as well. The stout-hearted are those who were, we might say, the bravest. The bravest of the enemy were plundered. That means you actually probably did something like knock them down and took their weapons and uh, destroyed them, but uh, they didn't stop you. You had God's power with you, God's blessing. It says they sank into sleep like they couldn't even move, or they were stunned. Now, that's a strange way to put it in our terms, but sometimes the Bible and its language, you got to remember, they thought in their day the way they thought, like we think in our day. I mean, we don't use swords and things like that, or shields, but in principle, we do have defensive weapons, and we have offensive weapons. It says they could not use their hands. You notice, and none of the men of war could use their hands. What's that mean? For some reason, they couldn't fight. Uh, even the stoutest and bravest of warriors were unable to get into the fight. Maybe they were all surprised. Uh, you know, you come in on their camp or you ambushed them. 
anyway, uh, they could be overwhelmed. They just couldn't do anything. It was so quick and so fast or something else. But it described it as being helpless. So this is the way the enemy were when God was with Israel in battle. Sometimes they were so overwhelmed and stunned. In fact, you read the stories of some of the battles like in the, uh, the historical books like the Kings or Chronicles or Samuels, the Samuel books, and you'll see that they just fled. They were so scared they fled. You know, and fear is often contagious. You start one group running away, then everybody says, oh no, then they all run away. So something like that's happening here. They just can't fight. So the enemy end up being helpless when they're facing an army backed by God. Verse 6. At your rebuke, God of Jacob, both rider and horse fell asleep. Now that's something we picture in our mind as kind of strange. What's rebuke mean? Well, rebuke means when someone straightens you out. It means reproval. It means uh, they're going to tell you what's right or wrong. If you're doing something wrong, they'll tell you right there. All right? Or they'll tell you, do something right. Quit doing things wrong. But when we see it like this, that you rebuke God of Jacob. In other words, God is involved in this uh, rebuke. God of Jacob, that's another name for Israel. Uh, remember that uh, Jacob was the son of Isaac and he was renamed Israel. So when you see the God of Jacob, it means the same as the God of Israel. So at this rebuke, both rider and horse become, notice, they fall asleep. Well, this is a way of saying they can't do anything. We use a big long word, incapacitated. They're helpless. And in a military context like this, it means the enemy could not respond to the threats that came at them. They couldn't act. They couldn't fight. It could be, as I mentioned earlier, they were so surprised or caught off guard that they found themselves unable to respond. All they could do is look at all the enemy around them with the weapons pointed at them and then throw up their hands and surrender. By the way, the horse here uh, could be char could be representing chariots. They'd have chariots in those days, you know. Just thought I'd mention that on the in addition. Now we turn to the psalmist continuing to speak to God. He says, you, he's talking to God, you are to be feared. And who can stand before you when you are angry? So the leader here, the song leader Asaph, he along with the congregation who would sing in those days, or we can do this on our own, we can look to God and say, you, you God, are to be feared. You're to be revered. You're to be held up. You're to be held in awe. And who can stand before you when you are angry? So God would be angry towards our enemies. So we recognize that no one can stand before an angry God. When God is ready to pour out his judgment, he'll do that, and people have to take it. And what this tells us is, it simply means that God is so powerful, we do call him the Almighty, that when he is angry, there is no one or nothing is able to stand against him. And this, by the way, is a form of praise because you're telling God, you're uh, ascribing to God, we call it ascribing, you're telling God, something of who he is. He's to be feared. And this is a form of praise describing his justice in action. Because God's justice, one of his characteristics of his essence, what he's made up of, you know, he is, God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. He's omnipotent. That means he's all powerful. He's love. He's righteous. He's just. He's merciful. He shows us grace. There's all sorts of wonderful characteristics about God. 
He's always truthful. Well, another thing about God, when he acts in justice, and sometimes that means judgment, and that's the way they, des they describe it as in anger, okay? He's just exercising his justice. No one can stand against that. And we acknowledge God, and that's what we're doing here. And this is another good reason to always want to be on God's side. Nothing can stand against him or should even try. Verse 8 goes on to describe how mankind can't do much when God is exercising anger towards mankind. Verse 8 and 9, I'll read that together. From the heavens you cause judgment to be heard. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to execute judgment to save all the humble of the earth. Well, now we see the other side of this. First of all, it says, from the heavens. Well, we know this is where God lives. This is the place from which he rules. Though he is everywhere, he's also pictured as headquartered, you might say, or dwelling in the temple in heaven over the created earth, right? He's over the created earth. From here, his judgment is heard. That's what it means when it says uh, it's heard. That's it, that's it being, it sounds forth. That's one way we put it. Sometimes if you've ever sat down, I'll be here in my office sometimes, and you might hear it over the, the, the speaker or I might hear it over the microphone when it starts to really thunder and lightning. Usually I have to shut down if it gets too bad. And uh, we're hearing weather heard, but at the same time, the weather is controlled by God. So in a sense, we're hearing something that God produces for us. And out comes the rain, wind and all that. In fact, it's been raining today here. And... Uh, when we hear that thunder, it's kind of like hearing God sounding forth. Now, when he's angry and he goes into battle with Israel, uh, he's heard as they see the enemy being wiped out. That's the way to put it. Notice in verse 9 it says, When God arose to execute judgment, it's like he got up and went to work. The other thing I want to go back and look at, look, the earth was, the earth feared and was steeled and was steel. They just, they're like frozen. When God's judgment comes forth, it's like they freeze when God arose to execute judgment. Now, the other side of that, the good side, to save all the humble of the earth. To save means to deliver, Right? Here, the humble are delivered from the enemy and the perils they bring. All the humble. What's the humble? Well, let's talk about the humble. A humble person is sometimes viewed as meek. Uh, you know, people use the line, the meek shall inherit the earth. Well, that means the humble. That's those, listen now, it's those who live submissive and obedient lives to God. That's a humble person. He's not trying to promote himself. He's not trying to make himself something he's not. But he lets God guide him and direct him in every way. Notice it says, of the earth. That's all the inhabitants of the earth. God's able to save anyone on earth. All right? From any peril. And uh, this is basically what it's saying. We recognize God is delivering us. And then we see Selah again. Pause in the music as far as we know. And then we come back to praise. Verse 10. Surely the wrath of God shall praise you. The rest of your anger you put on like a belt. Now I like this second line. It makes one think about what are they talking about? Well, let's break this down a little bit. People who see or experience the wrath of God should praise God. Now, listen to this. 
When you see God deal with our enemies, with your enemies, you praise him, right? Now, if the enemy decide to turn to God in a good way, they repent, uh, that would be uh, then a way for them to start to praise God. They say, okay, I cannot not go against this overwhelming army. This is God's army. I'm going against God, so I give up. I'm going to turn from my sin and want to do God's will. We do that in a small way, don't we? If we get away from God and our sin, we need to repent and get back with him. And then we praise God for his forgiveness. The fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins, he paid for our sins, and when we confess them here on earth, we're forgiven. That's 1 John 1, 9, what we do at the beginning of the lesson. Now, another side of this praising God for, uh, for wrath is when we see God's justice work. When we see God destroy our enemies, we praise him. We witness the wrath of and this is good reason to praise God. And then the second line, now this is interesting, the rest of your anger you put on like a belt. I don't know if you ever watch a war movie or even a police officer sometime, you'll look at his belt and he has a gun and sometimes he has some sort of spray mace and now they use those, you know, those things that shoot the electric shock out, I forgot what they call them. Sometimes they have sticks, I don't know if they carry sticks anymore. Well, that's, that's his, we might call that his gun belt, right? He has ammunition on there. He may have his handcuffs in the back, if you look carefully. Okay. Well, this is kind of like that. What anger God doesn't use, he puts the rest of it on his belt. Well, what does that mean? Well, when we think about it, it means, well, he keeps it handy. He has plenty of it there. It's like kind of like ammunition on his belt. So, this tells us that God doesn't run out of justice and applying his anger. It's always handy if he needs to use it again. So, you enemy out there, you remember that. Maybe you'll get away this time, but next time, remember, God still has a full load of justice. Our last two verses falls under this last heading. I'll put on the board again. Give God who rules over all his just due. Now this is a little different than what we've seen. Verse 11 reads, it's on the board. Make vows to the Lord your God and fulfill them. Let all around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared. Now here's a point that we need to come to us look at carefully because it doesn't really apply today. That means vows were under the old covenant. It was an old covenant practice that was given with the Mosaic law. We live under the new covenant, right? Old covenant is basically Old Testament. So here's a, here's a practice they did in those days that we don't do today. Now, vows, you probably know, was similar to a promise. It's almost like taking an oath. And they would use it to help them keep an obligation. Or maybe they'd say, well, God, if you'll do this for me, then I'll do that. Okay? It's a very dangerous thing to do because we have a tendency. If we do that today, we'd probably break it because it's too tempting. Uh, that's why we need to live by the Spirit. And we're basically told not to do vows today. That was something that was part of their worship in those days. It helped them in some ways. They're different. They didn't have the spirit indwelling like we do today. But uh, vows, taking a vow in those days was a way of submission, submitting to authorities, helping you submit to authority. And you kept your vow. All right? Now, we're not told to do vows for today. Why? Well, first of all, uh, we know that we're always supposed to be doing what's right and be honest and keep our word, right, and our obligations. So you shouldn't have to run around and say, well, I promise, I promise. No, just do what you say. You don't have to say, I promise. When you tell your mom and dad you'll do it, you don't say, okay, I promise. Don't do that. That's not a good idea. 
because it just means you're going to break your promise when you're disobedient. Now it's kind of like you've done two things wrong. You're not only disobedient, but you also broke your promise. But I don't think taking promises is a good idea. Uh, but you can understand the way they use promises today. It's sort of like it's a higher thing than rather just saying you're going to do it. Oh, I promise. I promise. Well, sometimes people use that just to fool people. You know that. So we don't do vows today, but rather we always do what's right and keep our word. Plus, the big thing is we have the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit can control our lives. So we don't have to lie. We don't have to exaggerate. We don't have to promise or take vows. The next line also really goes back in those days to let all around him bring gifts. Now this would be uh, people who would bring tributes or gifts all right, to the temple or perhaps to the king. All right. So we have honoring uh, to the temple would be a way of worshiping God. Now we do give gifts. Yes, when we uh, give to ministries, uh, we are giving gifts. That's an act of worship, and that's something we should do. We should give to ministries where uh, they minister to us. All right. This is an act of worship. And notice, to him who is to be feared. Now we've already seen where the one to be feared in this psalm is God. So we bring gifts to him who is to be feared. That be taking gifts to the temple. Or giving gifts to the king or tribute to the king. Because the king of Israel was God's king for his people. Alright, some people would want to support that. Or they would just go ahead and give gifts to the temple to build up the treasury there so they can minister. Okay. Verse 12 reminds us of God being in sovereign control. That means he has overall control over all the rulers of the earth. It reads, He will cut off the spirit of princes. He is feared by the kings of the earth. To cut off means to make it so they can't do it anymore or have what we would say access to it. It's closed to them. And the spirit means life, okay, or breath. God will cut off the spirit of princes. He can cut off their rule. He can cut off their function. He can even cut off their life. He is feared by the kings of the earth. God should be feared by the kings of the earth. Now, this is assuming they will do that, but this is kind of a way of saying you will do this. The kings of the earth ought to fear God. Now, many kings don't today. Many rulers don't. Don't even talk about God, and that's, that's one reason there's so many problems. But all kings and all rulers, in fact, all people, should be honoring God. And that would be to the advantage of the nation if a ruler, or we would say a president, or prime minister, whatever it may be, uh, uh, king or queen, I guess some still have queens, uh, if they would honor God in doing so, they'd have a better ruler, or better rule. Uh, God does promote and demote rulers. If you remember the story of David and Saul, Saul was removed as king. David was promoted as king. Acts 13.22 talks about that. Let's pull a verse from Daniel for a moment and look at it. This is uh, Daniel speaking of God. It says, He changes times and seasons, removing kings and establishing kings. You see that? He removes kings and establishing kings giving wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So wisdom is there, but you have to go to God for it. The word of God is full of wisdom. We've studied that so many times, especially you've been with me in Proverbs. Well, the thing we want to learn here is that God is sovereign overall. That means he has overall rule. He does what he wants. He always knows what's best. 
and he always has the power to do it. Well, let's close by reading through our psalm. Always a good idea to read through it and see how much we remember and see how much we've learned. So let's start from the beginning. Here we go. Psalm 76. To the director of music with stringed instruments, a psalm of Asaph, a psalm. God is known in Judah. In Israel, his name is great. His lair is in Salem, his den in Zion. There he broke the flames of the bow, the shield, the sword, and the weapons of war, Selah. Glorious are you, more majestic than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted were plundered, they sank into sleep, and none of the men of war could use their hands. At your rebuke, God of Jacob, both rider and horse fell asleep. You, you are to be feared, and who can stand before you when you are angry? From the heavens you cause judgment to be heard, the earth feared and was still. When God arose to execute judgment, to save all the humble of the earth, Selah. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The rest of your anger you put on like a belt. Make vows to the Lord your God and fulfill them. Let all around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared. He will cut off the spirit of princes. He is feared by the kings of the earth. Let's pray. Well, Father, again, we thank you for another wonderful psalm. Thank you for your truth. Help us learn from what we study today, properly apply it, and we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.